Good evening. My name is Takiwa Smith, founder and executive director of Science Engineering and Mathematics Link Incorporated, and I want to welcome you to our Team Science Cafe. Our Team Science Cafe is our Math and Science Career Academies program for teens that provides them with opportunities to meet and interact with the STEM community to learn about STEM careers at a critical time in their K through 12 educational experience in their teenage years where they can make decisions about high school and college. And so without further ado, I am going to introduce our program coordinator, Carlin Pounders, so she can introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, Takiwa. Hi, everyone. Oh, wait, wait, Carlin, I forgot. This is a special edition, I'm sorry. Yes. How could I forget this is a chemical <laughs> engineer? This week is National Chemistry Week, and we have been celebrating all week. So I'm gonna do a slangish plug if you have not registered for our virtual National Chemistry Week celebration, do that on Saturday as well. But this is National Chemistry Week. So of course, our guest is a chemist. <laughs> um, and we're just celebrating the wonderful contributions of chemistry to our society this week through all our program activities. So I'm sorry, Carla, but go ahead and introduce tonight. <laughs> yes, no, thank you for mentioning that. Um, so our speaker tonight is Dr. Julius Green the first. He is a native of Detroit, Michigan, and had a love of learning and science at an early age. He's a survivor of childhood cancer, and Dr. Green was fascinated by science and medicine and the good that it can do for people. After up obtaining a BS in chemistry from Morehouse College in 2003, Dr. Green joined Corporate America serving in roles such as quality control chemist and research and development chemist. Dr. Green obtained an MS in chemistry from Georgia State University. I'm also an alumni of Georgia State in 2008 while still working in corporate America. During this time, Dr. Green engaged in volunteer outreach work for the Atlanta chapter of the American Chemical Society. Additionally, Dr. Green organized the largest networking event for minority chemists in the Atlanta area for eight years in an effort to engage more minority chemists. After obtaining a PhD in medicinal organic chemistry from GSU, Dr. Green moved to Washington, DC in 2015 to continue work in education and advocacy as an adjunct professor and executive director and executive director of a small community-based DC area nonprofit that empowered youth and supported disenfranchised communities in DC's Ward 7 and 8. Dr. Green currently serves on the National Committee of Minority Affairs for the American Chemical Society and has recently relocated to Boston, Massachusetts to continue work in education and start a pharmaceutical research company. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Green. Wow. Um, thank you, Carlin. That I love the way you read that. It was so animated. I, I really want to just record that and put that as a little trailer every time I speak online. Um, hello, everyone. This is a very unique experience, as COVID has done for us uh, throughout 2020. If uh, I were with you in person, I'll uh, be interacting with you all more, but we'll do the best we can with what we have. So as Carlin said, I'm Dr. Julius Green the first. I'm originally from um, Detroit, Michigan, and I am what is called a medicinal organic um, chemist. <clears throat> so currently my career is in academia and I'm an adjunct professor at Regis College and a visiting scholar at Bentley University. Now, before uh, we move on, uh, Carlin already told me, told you all a lot about me, but I want to see uh, just a little bit about you. So if you can, in the chat, uh, let me know what some of your interests or skill sets are. Uh, so an interest is something that you'd like to do or take part in. And a skill set is um, a knowledge, experience, uh, or ability that you can use to do a job. So in the chat, if you can just you know, type in an interest or a skill set that you have. An interest is something that you like to do or take part in. And a skill set is some knowledge, experience, 
or ability that you can use to do a job. And I'll go ahead and start off. Um, so like one of my interests is like making and listening to music. Uh, especially when I was a teenager, I could, um, you know, just listen to music for hours and hours. I would even uh, play radio back then. It's easier now with computers, but back then when I only had like tape decks and CDs, uh, uh, CDs I would pretend like I was on the radio. Um, another interest I have is also is uh, social justice. I have a big interest in um, access and equality for all people. So I'm going to give you all uh, some more time to put in your interests and skill sets. I'm going to, and I'll read them off uh, a little bit later. Uh, another skill set I have, a skill set that I have is leadership. So leadership is the ability to uh, lead people into uh, new arenas. And I noticed I had leadership abilities because uh, people are always just placing me into leadership positions. So. I might as well just do jobs and do the job well since people are always putting me in there. Um, let's see, do we have anything up? I'm showing my age here because I'm trying to read and at the same time uh, conduct this. So I'll just stop and keep on moving. Um, so since I can't see it, some other interests that you all may have uh, can be gaming. So I know my nephew, he loves uh, Minecraft and Nintendo and uh, that whole PlayStation stuff. So gaming is an interest. Traveling, I like to travel, um, art, history, reading, um, some skill sets, some other skill sets uh, that you can write down. And hopefully you can write this down because this will help you out in your career. Um, some other skill sets that you can use are teamwork, uh, adaptability, conflict resolution, self-motivation, and time management. So why am I talking about interests and skill sets? on um, what should be a STEM talk. Well, it turns out that knowing your knowing yourself, so knowing your interests and your skill sets uh, will design you and lead you on the path that you want for a career, no matter what career that you uh, think that you can head out to. So let's see, let's read here. Do, 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 do. Still trying to look at the chat. So I'll get started with my story. As mentioned earlier, I am a survivor of childhood cancer. So uh, I was born with uh, a cancer called Wilms tumor, which affects the kidney. So uh, it's something that develops in the fetus. And uh, so when I was born, I was basically born with a tumor and it was uh, not noticed for the first two years of my life. So when it was finally noticed, uh, I spent a lot of my times in the hospital and what should have really been like a traumatic experience uh, really wasn't for me. I actually enjoyed going to the hospital. Um, so I didn't like going to the big machines because they made me sick or getting stuck with needles because, you know, they hurt. But what I liked was how everything was different. So even though I didn't like the big machines, I wondered what they were doing. Um, even though I didn't like all the surgeries and all the needles and uh, all the things that go into uh, being a cancer patient and being around the hospital, I still was interested in what was going on. And over time, I aligned myself with being a physician. And I had in my mind early on that I wanted to be a, a pediatric hematologist oncologist. That's a fancy way of saying I want to be a doctor that treats cancer uh, and blood diseases in children. Also, uh, as a child, so this this uh, fashion, my interest in things that were scientific and weird. So every time we would go to the grocery store or CVS, I just had to have some slime from uh, the coin ball machine because, you know, slime was just so different. I love Lego blocks. I love building things. I loved anything that was weird. I love going into my backyard and terrorizing the worms and cutting them in half and seeing that, wow, both sides live. I, I, I was all that. I was a little, you know, terror, uh, terrorizing boy in the backyard, terrorizing all the little, you know, animals and critters. And I was also into microscopes and uh, chemistry sets. So as I was growing up and I knew that at an early age, I wanted to be a physician. I knew that in order to be a physician, I had to go to college. 
this was the 80s. I just dated myself, but this was the 80s and the early 90s. So this is the time of um, Bill Cosby and A Different World. So it was directly on my mind that in order to be this physician um, to heal cancer in children and sick children, I have to go to college. Uh, luckily, being around all those physicians growing up got me interested into science early. So growing up, back then we had encyclopedia sets, which were these very big books uh, alphabetized from A to Z. It was like Google or Wikipedia, but it actually in book form. And I'll actually read those. Uh, they had a lot of pretty pictures and I'll actually read those from cover to cover uh, to learn a lot of things. Excuse me. So as I was growing up and um, exploring my love of Legos and my love of science, I was introduced to into uh, some other things that expanded my knowledge. Uh, I started playing this math game called Academic Games. And um, it brought out an, another side of me that I love, which was competitive. So having childhood cancer prevented me from being athletic, but I could use that outlet of being competitive through these math games. And the math games also had uh, the double-edged sword, which is probably how they were designed of teaching me higher math at an uh, early age. Also growing up, so as I became a teenager like you all, I said that, uh, I said earlier that one of the things I loved was music. So I, I began to get deeper into my music. I began singing. Um, I began playing on the piano, not only playing music, but composing songs. And then all that had to stop because I had to grow up. So at 18, I had to stop playing with Legos and I had to go to college because it was my dream to be a physician and college was my way to do it. So the turn of the century, I was accepted into uh, Morehouse College as a chemist. And Morehouse College is an HBCU, a historically black college uh, university. And actually I misspoke, I was accepted as a sales, accepted as a chemist, but it, actually I was accepted as a biologist. So I wanted to be a biologist because I wanted to be a physician. Um, however, biology did not work well for me because in biology, you had to uh, memorize a lot of things. And my mind doesn't work well with memorization. My mind works well with figuring things out. So after uh, my sophomore year in college, I quickly uh, changed my major from biology to chemistry because I could do, just naturally do better in chemistry. Oh, excuse me. Now, before I get more into my career, how I got there, I want to share to you, share with you what it is that I do. So I am a medicinal organic chemist. What does that mean? Organic chemistry means that one puts uh, things together, uh, molecules of carbon together. And medicinal just means for medical or pharmaceutical purposes. So a medicinal organic chemist puts together carbon-based molecules for medical and pharmaceutical purposes. Now, how did I get into medicinal organic chemistry? Well, I got interested into uh, medicinal organic chemistry after graduating from Morehouse and uh, entering the working world and then going back to school while working at Georgia State and getting a master's in biochemistry. So while getting this master's in biochemistry, I was exposed to DNA, which is, and I'm gonna do a screen share here, Come on, technology. Yay. Oops. I did it wrong. Do that one more time. So while getting my uh, master's in biochemistry at Georgia State, I fell in love with DNA. And what you see right here is a molecule of double-stranded DNA. DNA is in charge of telling your cells who you are, and what your and tells your cells what to do, and this is inside pretty much every cell in your body. So I fell in love with this molecule while at Georgia State. So at Georgia State, I found out that you can do something that I think is pretty awesome, 
And that is something called photodynamic therapy. That is basically exposing DNA that is bound to a molecule, exposing it to light, and then using that light to cause damage. And you can use this technology to fight cancer. And I was just like, wow, you can use light and DNA to fight cancer? Um, and this is just so fascinating to me. So here, it kind of brought me full circle because I wasn't going to be the physician um, that I had set out to be earlier in life. But here I am as a chemist and or the forefront of fighting cancer. After getting my master's uh, in biochemistry, um, I wanted to go further in my education because I was dissatisfied with uh, the nine to five working life. Um, I wasn't doing what I what I loved. And I felt that the only way I could do what I, what I loved was to get uh, even more education. So I took an assessment of what it is that I really wanted to do. Um, at the time, HIV uh, was a, well, was and is a very big pandemic. So I wanted to design drugs that um, targeted the nucleic acids, that would be the DNA and RNA, uh, similar to the molecule I just showed you, of viruses. So I wanted to make drugs that uh, binds to the DNA and RNA of viruses to treat diseases. I ended up completing the program successfully and getting a PhD in 2014. However, I couldn't get a job. Um, and I'm also a natural reclusive. Um, so it weighed heavily on me uh, to the point of depression that uh, I hear I, is that I had this degree that I worked so hard for and I couldn't get a job. And the depression got so bad that I ended up moving um, to DC in search of job opportunities and ended up becoming homeless and living in my car uh, for three months. But while I was homeless, um, I ended up being connected to a nonprofit through my church and that totally changed my world. So through this nonprofit, um, I ended up putting on health fairs which, which serve disadvantaged uh, people in Southeast uh, DC. Uh, we service about 500 people who didn't have uh, have access to healthcare services or whole health services, what we call whole health services. So not just your physical body, but your social and mental well-being. Um, we also did like programs for uh, about 250 youth annually, giving them paid internships to teach them um, soft skills and um, teach them to open themselves up and to open up their interests and learn where their skill sets are. This was a totally new career to me that I didn't know was an option um, before I had gone to grad school and after after I had graduated. But I thoroughly enjoyed it because it satisfied um, this need I had to do social justice. And it was actually one of the reasons why I moved to D.C., which was to do social justice and advocacy work. While growing up, and while not only while growing up in Detroit, but also while being in the workforce, um, I noticed that opportunities for African-Americans weren't equal. So um, in Detroit, some of you may be familiar with the movie Eight Mile. Uh, that's the actual street. So under that's the boundary line between the city and the suburbs. So there's a stark difference after you go north of Eight Mile to the affluent suburbs. And then when you go south of Eight Mile, uh, what the mostly African-American people are. I noticed that difference. And then also when I was in um, the working world, I noticed that a lot of the low paying jobs uh, we're going to African-American low-paying scientific jobs. Um, and I wanted to change that. I wanted to be a change agent for that. And I saw my work in D.C. as something towards that. However, um, I still wasn't satisfied because I wanted to do chemistry. It just so happened that um, one day, a person I had met a year earlier at, at a party um, for Labor Day had been promoted to department chair, um, chemistry department chair of a local college and asked me if I wanted a teaching position. And I said, yes. So that led me to an academic position. And so at, at my time in DC, I was able to explore academia as well as explore the nonprofit world and be exposed to uh, new avenues of academia in the nonprofit world. 
um, to satisfy me. Um, so after four years in DC, I decided to move to Boston for even more career opportunities. And my network led me to not only um, the action position I have now, but also to the visiting scholars uh, position that I have at Bentley University. So the adjunct position allows me to uh, continue my teaching. Um, at first, I used to be scared of teaching because, uh, well, for one, kids used to scare me um, because I used to be a teenager, so I know how teenagers are. Um, but two, I take education very seriously, and I always want to make sure that I'm teaching people uh, the right thing. And uh, I was just scared of not believing in myself. But uh, I noticed that I'm actually good at teaching. Um, I like teaching people new things. I actually, I'm so nerdy. I love chemistry so much um, that I enjoy uh, teaching nursing uh, nurses new thing. I teach nursing chemistry right now. I've also done uh, pharmaceutical chemistry, so I teach uh, future pharmacists and the future of chemistry. I also teach people in the community who have who don't care about chemistry. They just in it for a grade, and um, I just love opening up and exposing them to new things. So at my visiting scholarship at Bentley, I'm able to do research. So I can teach at Regis and I'm able to do research into DNA at Bentley. While putting my life back together from um, being homeless, I noticed that all of my positions after getting a PhD and after being homeless came from networking. So, these networks came about from just people I naturally know. And so before I end, I would like to give you all some tips on um, how you can use your skill sets and your interests to build the career that you want. And the career that you want looks as something that makes you happy and makes you fulfill, gives you that sense of fulfillment every day. So like I said earlier, um, I noticed that the jobs that I was getting was built upon the relationships and networks that I it had. So these networks came about from just me being me, from me talking about boring stuff. So I have a boring side. Um, me talking about boring stuff like governance and fundraising. That's boring to some people, but I get my life off of it. I love it. Um, me talking to just other people about science. So I really just love chemistry. And if you wanna ask me a chemistry question, even if I don't know the answer, I'll figure it out and we'll get back to you, you know, soon because I just want you to have the answer or nerdy stuff. So things like Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Uh, I love trading card games. It brings out my competitive side. So I have friends that we play Yu-Gi-Oh and we talk about Yu-Gi-Oh all, all the time or friends that, you know, you just have fun all the time with and all the, the things that you only talk about are what we're going to for your birthdays. These people, as well as your friends, and your family and your local social um, social network are the the network and the building blocks that you need to use to help you build your career. When you align yourself with people of your interests, you're more exposed to things that suit your interests, and you're more those people who have the same interests in you as you probably also have the same career, so it also also offers you some career guidance. Also. Your friends and your families are usually your number one advocate. So maintaining a good relationship with your friends and your family um, will also give you unique career opportunities because they may know something, um, give you a heads up on a, a career opportunity, an HR position, or be able to put in a good word for you. Or they may just be in a position to, uh, to hire you, uh, like I found myself in. I just had uh, friends and colleagues who were just in position to hire me. And um, I was able to get a job and um, pull myself out, out of homelessness and build a career that I like. So to end, check on your relationships, maintain your relationships, but also maintain a relationship with yourself. So while working in the nonprofit industry in D.C., um, as scientists, we tend to think that being physical, everything has to be physical. Um, yes, that has its importance but you are also a human. So you need to maintain your uh, mental well-being. So taking rest, uh, taking mental breaks, and you also need to know maintain your uh, social and spiritual uh, well-being. 
and you can use uh, whatever spiritual practice works for you and social practices. So um, right now we're a little limited because of COVID. So the limitation of, of our sociability is uh, Zoom and electronic platforms. Um, but going out with something social, seeing somebody new, um, Thanksgiving is a social event, going out to parties with, um, I want to say with the mask, but you know, the numbers are rising. So going out to parties after COVID, socializing with people, that's very important. So now I'm doing what I love. I'm an adjunct professor. I'm a uh, visiting research scholar. I'm doing outreach work like this. Um, I get to satisfy my competitive edge by participating in academia. Um, I've gotten back into my music. Uh, I don't think you can see my keyboard. I don't want to show you my business, but uh, I've gotten back into my uh, music. And most importantly, I'm doing something where I get to play with DNA and design drugs that cure disease, and, including ca cancer, possibly in the future. So with that being said, uh, that is the end of my talk, and we're going to do a demonstration that is going to showcase my love of DNA. I sent over um, a link to a PDF called uh, How to Extract DNA from Strawberries. Um, so what we're going to do is that we're going to extract DNA from strawberries. Um, you don't have to use strawberries. You can use bananas or kiwi, um, but those would be the best fruits because they have uh, a high DNA content. So I did this earlier on camera as practice, but there was more light. So as I set up, whoops, as I set up, get my materials together. And I think the materials, um, will also be in the chat as um, also the link which has the materials. So you should have, just give me one second. If you wanna do this um, at home right now or you can do this at home later, um, you'll need a cup. So buh, buh, buh. I have a cup, I have several cups. Some strawberries. So I had to go to the grocery store earlier today, get some strawberries. But if you have one of those households, you just have strawberries lying around, you are ahead in life. Let's see. Some soap. Uh oh, I misplaced my soap. I might have to get that. So I'll get the soap later. Table salt. Coffee filters. A spoon, okay, here's the camera, a Q-tip. You need some water, some water in here. And I'm gonna pause my screen real quick because I'm gonna get the most important ingredient. So while Dr. Um, Green is getting his soap, I just wanted to say, like, one of the things that I love about his talk so much is when you think about chemistry, you never think about how it applies to every day, right? And how it solves problems and real world problems. So as you think about chemistry and as we're celebrating chemistry week, think of the different ways that chemistry impacts your everyday lives. Like how when you get sick and you go to the doctor, it's probably a chemist that helped discover the treatment plan that the doctor is using to treat you, correct? Like whatever medicines, yes. is that correct, yes. Dr. Green? That's exactly it. Okay, I'm so. gonna go out, go and let you go back to it. <laughs> okay. But that was just awesome, just that connection, like between <laughs> chemistry and medicine and how chemistry connects to things that makes us feel better, whether it's the cold or, you know, other diseases like cancer. Yes, yes. So I had to get my special ingredient. This is rubbing alcohol, but the rubbing alcohol has to be uh, cold. So this has been sitting in the freezer just for this special moment with you all. Two more materials. 
um, some soap, regular dish soap. And here we go. And a plastic bag. So how do we extract DNA from strawberries? The DNA in strawberries is trapped inside the center of the cells and what is called the nucleus. So what we have to do is get the DNA out. First thing that we're going to do, let's see, I'm trying to get the biggest strawberries because we want a lot of DNA. So we're going to pick two strawberries. I'm going to put them in this plastic bag. And I'm going to squeeze the air out. Get as much air out as possible. And then close the plastic bag. Now what we want to do is that we want to get the DNA out of the cells of the nucleus. So to help that process, we're going to squish the DNA. I'm sorry, we're going to squish the strawberries. So we can start breaking down those cell walls and cell membranes, start exposing the contents of the cells. Now you can, usually when I do this in person, I like have it flat on a surface and I use my hands to squish it down. But I want to give you all the joy of seeing me do this. And what you want to do is make sure that you get all the pieces. So you don't want any big pieces. And you, it's really best if you're not going to squish them down with your palms. Get them in between your fingers and your thumbs and just really squish. Now, this is the fun part, but you do have to be careful. Because if you squish too hard or squish in the wrong way, you can pop out some strawberry juice everywhere. So I'm trying to be very careful because I have my iPad, my laptop, other electronics over here. And I don't want strawberry juice squirting on them everywhere and damaging them. Okay. Da -da 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 -da. I'm going to put this to the side. It smells so good. If you do this, it will smell so good. It's making me hungry. I'm going to put this to the side. And I'm going to pour about a cup of water. Where's my special? Okay. Just a cup. Now, the only reason why I know what a cup looks like in here is because I use this all the time. Um, to cook, but you should uh, actually have like a measuring cup so you can be exact in your measurements. So I have a cup of water and I'm going to add um, a quarter teaspoon of salt. Put that in the water. Oh, I can't hear you, Tequila. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have a quick question. Sorry to interrupt your demo. Yes. But you said something about exact measurements. Why yeah. are using exact measurements important for chemists than when you're doing chemistry experiments? Yes. Yeah, so um, what is a good way of putting this? Uh, the components of a reaction and the concentration of the materials of a reaction affects how the affects how a reaction goes. So if you use too much or too little of um, a chemical for a chemical reaction, that can actually affect the outcome. So if I were to use, let's see, we're supposed to use a cup of water. If I were to use, let's say, a gallon of water, that will affect the outcome as in I won't be able to get the DNA out because uh, the solution will be too dilute and the DNA won't won't saturate out. So when you're doing, that's a great question. When you're doing scientific experiments, you want to be very accurate in um, doing the procedures because uh, it will affect your results. Hmm. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and, and so um, another thing that Taki would, something Taki would just pointed out. Um, so if I were in my lab, uh, I would have like 
uh, graduated cylinders and a measuring cup and all that. So everything could be precise, uh, accurately measured. I don't have those things with me. Um, however, I'm doing something that I uh, tell Susan not to do, which is eyeball this. Um, I'm a trained professional, so I can kind of like eyeball, uh, not really, but I can kind of like eyeball uh, amounts. But don't you do this at home. So anyway, going over, going on, how much uh, soap do we need? I think we need 10 milliliters. So put that in there. And then we're just going to mix. And then let me be careful because I'm over my electronics. I said that because I just made a mess of my keyboard. <laughs> It'll be all right. That's what I'm telling myself. Okay, now where's our DNA? We are going to pour our mixture into the bag. Seal it up. And it's mostly liquid right now. So I'm just going to like gently move it around. Just make sure all that DNA gets into our extraction liquid. So let's do this for about 30 seconds. So this really smells like a smoothie because this is smushed up strawberries. And I use orange scented um, dish soap. So this is really smelling good. If I had a blender, I would make a smoothie right now with oranges and strawberries. Oops. Okay, now I'm going to take a cup. As a matter of fact, I'll use this one. Just give me one sec. I need to rinse out my old cup. I wasn't going to use it at first, but it's clear and you can see better. So rinse that out. Okay. Okay, so now this is what we're going to do. I'm going to take a cup, get some coffee filters, and I'm going to place it over the cup and bend the coffee filter over the edges, so. Blossom it like a flower, like this. Oops. Now holding the edges. This part's gonna get tricky. Holding the edges, open up your Ziploc bag, and then pour the contents of the bag into the filter. And then let me move away from my computer so I can get over my anxiety. <laughs> so you want to pour all these contents, all the strawberry goodness, into the filter. Let's see, can you see anything? Okay. I'm trying to angle and work my angles. <laughs> And whoops, I forget how messy this lab can be. So here we have the strawberry juice and I'm gonna help it out just a little bit. I'm gonna squeeze it just a little bit. I don't wanna squeeze it so much that the bits of strawberry come through the filter or that the filter busts open. I only want the juice to come out. That's where our DNA is. Whew. Okay, almost there.
almost. Whoops. All right, I'll put this up. So here we have our strawberry juice. And now I'm going to put in the most important ingredient. This is where the magic happens. I'm going to put in some cold rubbing alcohol. And then we're just going to let it sit for a little bit. And what you're going to see is like some, uh, let's see, some snot like material. Let's. Ooh. Where does. Okay. So you can kind of grab it out with your. with a Q-tip, almost had it. Okay, I don't know if you can see that snotty stuff. It's like mucus, but that is DNA. And it's all over this Q-tip. The lighting isn't very good, but when you do this, if you do this at home, you notice this very mucusy So you can touch it. It feels like you just wiped the baby's nose. You can kind of see it at the top. I can't, oops. Let's see, can I get you all to? Well, that's about it, because I'm scared to move my uh, laptop over this juice and spill it because this cup is kind of full. But you can see the DNA. It'll be floating at the top. It'll be some snot light consistency, mucus-like consistency, and you can actually save it. So I've put this into a vial. There you, that's a good one. There we go. So this is DNA. So you can actually put this into a vial and save it. I've saved it for years. And to give you a sense of what I do in the lab, I have this highlighter. So highlighters have, um, this property where they kind of fluoresce and they have a fluorescent ink in there. One experiment you can do at home and hopefully um, you could tell similarly later how it works. If you isolate the DNA and put it into a separate vial of its own water and then all you have to do is just put a little dip a highlighter in there. The water will turn yellow. So this didn't turn yellow right now because you have the red strawberries in there. But some of the dye from the um, highlighter should get into the DNA. And then if you take the DNA out again, it should fluoresce. So that's basically what I do in a nutshell is I make fluorescent compounds that, you know, have the properties of like highlighters. And when you go to um, like a fair or amusement park, those glow sticks, I make compounds like that. And then I see they bind to DNA. And then um, I use that, those properties as treatments for disease. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. And I'd like to thank you all for this opportunity and for uh, indulging me for the last 30 minutes. And I will turn things over to Takiwa and Carolyn. Wow, so that was amazing. I love the <laughs> part of hearing about your STEM journey. Um, you know, I definitely hope that, um, Takiwa, do we have time for um, one or two questions? Yeah, we have time for one or two questions. Okay, so what I loved about your story is how it spoke to you being resilient in different, um, you know, times at your life. And um, I definitely think that that's something that, um, youth pursuing STEM careers also need to harness, you know, because um, STEM, most STEM careers are very difficult, right? Um, and so, you know, I was just wondering 
um, what were you thinking in order to get through, um, especially, you know, when you were homeless after getting your degrees, um, what were some things that you were thinking just to um, get you through? Um, oh, there's several things I want to address in that. So uh, resiliency and STEM. Um, I find that a lot of, what's a good way of saying this? Um, so a lot of people think that STEM is hard. Um, I, I find that you just, people just need to find a way to make STEM work for them. So find that good perspective. Um, now the good thing about getting a PhD is that, um, when you're, no matter what PhD you're doing, getting, it's a hard topic. You're doing something that's never been researched before. Um, and it causes you to question yourself and it builds up that resiliency. Um, and that resiliency is also very important for um, people of color in the STEM field, because just being honest, um, the cards are stacked against you. And, you know, there are going to be times when you should have heard yes, and it's going to be no, and you just have to keep on moving. Um, now, w when I was homeless, uh, I don't yeah, oof, I don't know what it was. It was just like, I know it, it has to be better than this coming up. Um and that's something that's also something I learned in my STEM careers, uh, even in academia. Uh, so there's this one class called differential equations. That's a higher order mathematics class. Very, I see you shaking your head, Tequila. Very, very whoo, you can have nightmares about it. And my senior year was it was the class uh I needed to graduate. And I'm at the professor's office, like, oh my God, can I, you know, please it, can I just get to see because I got this family coming for the graduation. Um, and I made it. Um, and I say that because there are going to be times when you think that you're not going to make it. Even if I hadn't passed the class, I can always retake it again, you know, over the summer or, you know, just postpone my graduation. Just keep on going. Um, and eventually you're going to reach your goals. It's going to work out for you, especially if you maintain that support group I talked about earlier. Um, and then my second question was um, mm -hmm. related to how you talked about um, networking and knowing people um, is what helped you um, to find opportunity and in, in, in jobs. Um, what are, um, you know, some um, tips that you would give to youth on how to build those relationships? So really discover who you are and be with people who make you feel good about yourself um, and make you feel um, whole, <laughs> excuse me. And so that includes your um, friends and family and neighbors, um, even classmates, because you really need, um, you really need that support to just carry you over. You need somebody who's just saying, you know, yes, best friend, that's the best, that's the best idea I ever heard of. And you, sh you should go ahead and do that. Uh, um, you know, baby, grandmother, baby, I believe in you. Uh, she may not understand um, multidimensional calculus, but she believes you can do it. You need that support in you, uh, in your in your network to just motivate you to keep on move, pushing forward. STEM fields are highly competitive. And with that competition, um, there's always going to be somebody who's better than you than something, knows more than you than something, but you're just as good. You're measure, you measure up. Your skill sets are just as good. Your interests are just as valid. And keeping that network is going to um, keep that self-esteem up to let you know that you have a seat at the table and you deserve that seat. Yep. That's all the questions we have. Oh. This is a great presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much. And yes, um, I was an engineering major, so I had to take differential equations. <laughs> We called it engineering math. Um, <laughs> Cal 3 was one of those things. I'm like, Lord Jesus, this ain't the same as Cal mm -hmm. 2. How can I make it? I'm not about to be an engineer because I can't get through Cal 3. But thankfully, you know, my Cal 2 teacher was my Cal 3 teacher. And he believed in me. and He helped me. He was like, you were good in Cal 2. You mm -hmm. cannot be this bad in Cal 3. I'm like, yes, I can. <laughs> it's like, we want to help you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the importance of networking. Um, it not only helps you in school, but it, it it helps you with 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 working. Like, I didn't believe it when people told me that you need a network in order to have 
a, a good career, but it's totally true. And you don't have to do these networking plans that are um, like, I go to a lot of conventions and I meet a lot of people and I meet people that I'll probably never see again to the next convention and never like really, com you know, really talk to again. You don't have to consider that your network. It is, but just being with people who you like and you can be yourself around that that's just enough. I really love that. <laughs> I love that too. That's some great advice. So I do have one question. So uh -huh. um, <laughs> my question's not that hard. So <laughs> if if um, you know a person has a interest in chemist chemistry, um, what is the best way for them to discover um, what area of chemistry they would like? Because like our I was a chemical engineer. I like biomedical chemistry. Our IG takeover person was an analytical chemist. You are a medicinal organic chemist. Yes. I have a friend that's a synthetic organic chemist. Like, <laughs> so it's all these <laughs> different ways you can study chemistry and make a difference. How do you figure that out? And how do you mm -hmm. choose which one you, how do you first learn what they are, right? And then how do you get exposed to which one you may like the best and then pursue that? Uh, so first and foremost, to be successful in chemistry, um, you do have to have some type of math basis. Uh, you don't have to be a mathematical genius, um, but you should at least be good in algebra. Um, now, as far as the varied fields of chemistry, the only way to learn how many there, uh, you know, what they are is to just research and be exposed to them. Um, like contact people that you know are chemists, um, contact schools, go on their websites, and you can learn about the different branches of chemistry. And to see um, which branch of chemistry applies to you, identify the chemistry around you and see how you most relate to it. And so what I mean by that is um, a lot of people are shocked to discover that cooking is actually chemistry. Um, and so people who are good at cooking, that's not me, but people who are good at cooking, if you have an interest in, in chemistry, there are a lot of uh, cooking books out there that explain the chemistry of, of cooking to you. You can incorporate that into your cooking to make yourself even a better cook. Um, my story is because I had a health interest. And um, when I found out about organic chemistry, I just automatically associated that with putting drugs together. And just um, from me exploring organic chemistry deeper, I had never heard of medicinal organic chemistry until I got to grad school. And I was like, when I heard the title, I was like, hey, that's me. That's what I want to do. Um, analytical chemistry, if you're the type of person who just wants to figure out um, what things are made of. So let's see, this plastic cup, if you want to know what this plastic cup is made of, um, you can take it to a lab and analyze um, what the polymer is chains are, what other additives are there. A, you can, um, if you're interested in learning that, um, there are a lot of schools, so universities are good resources. Um, libraries and books are a good resource. Um, also companies, so there are analytical companies, pharmaceutical companies, um, chemical engineering, if you're interested in chemical engineering. Um, you can look at chemical engineering companies. Um, Chemical engineering is a little bit deeper than chemistry. So that's the process of, of doing chemistry, but at like a, at a very grant at a very big scale. So uh as an example. I say we use chemistry to make stuff. That's how I yeah. explain chemical engineering to little kids. <laughs> <laughs> so I make drugs, but the the amount of drugs I make is at a very small amount. It's called the the milligram level. But a chemical, a chemical engineer will discover how to make that same drug at the kilogram level so that it can be uh, distributed in a bigger fashion. So let's, like, like, let's say this COVID vaccine is coming out. You'll need an engineer to go through <laughs> uh, the process of how to make a large number of vaccines and how to make the vaccine safely, um, how to make each vaccine safely so that uh, everybody... Uh, won't be exposed to negative con uh, complications that they don't need to be exposed to. So that's what a chemical engineer would do. So just look at the world around you. I will, at an event like this, I always tell uh, youth, you know, point to me and then point to yourself. We're all just a bag of chemicals. Point to your shoes. 
point to the wall. Everything is a chemical. Find out what it is that you like about the world and then just figure out what your little niche is uh, about that piece of the world for yourself. Thank you. That can apply to any STEM career, right? Like that's how yes. you found out what you're interested in. Yeah, because, you know, I started off um, it's another good, good thing about this is being exposed to opportunities. So growing up, I just wanted to be a, a physician because that's all I was exposed to. Um, I knew this is a, this aligned with my interest at that time. So being a, a physician um, was most likely the case. But like I said earlier, biology is not for me. Um, but at this age, your career may change 10 or five years from now. Um, it may not. But you just need to identify um, what it is that you can use, what's at your disposal to get to how to get to the the destination that you that you want to get to. Um, so with chemistry, I may not be a physician, but I'm still in the medical field. I'm still contributing to the health to the health field. Um, I know Tequila, you started off as a chemical engineer, um, and then yeah. you switched. <laughs> And then you switch careers um, and you're and you may not be in the chemical engineering field, but you're still using STEM in a way that is fulfilling to you and it's fulfilling to other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so. it's transferable skills that you'd get from STEM that you can kind of chart your path. Um, so I may not be using, you know, my skills on learning thermodynamics, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't even have my peries, but the things that I learned, you know, in engineering school and early in my career helps me do things to help prepare future engineers, right? Mm -hmm. So you can figure out problems, you can balance a budget. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All well, that from science. You. All that from science. So thank you so much, Dr. Green. And thank you for everyone that is tuning in live or checking out our YouTube. <laughs> We've learned so much. Um, I didn't know what you were going to talk about with your title because I'm like, twist and turns. But I, I think it's important <laughs> to have that, right? Because, you know, I'm not going to tell my age because women don't tell our ages. Black women don't tell our ages, right? <laughs> but you know the reality of you know our generation and beyond. The reality of it is, you're not going to like your grandparents or even for some of you, your great grandparents, start a job and stay in that same career path till you retire. More than likely, you know you may have. I have friends that are on their third, fourth career path, right? And so, so learning, excuse me, things that you taught us tonight really let us know like it is possible to adapt. You don't feel like you have to stay on this same path or stay in this box that you can adjust based to how your life changes, how your interest changes and what opportunities come your way. Um, so thank you so much for giving us that pathway and, and um idea that it's okay to do that. I'm like losing all the words, but thank you for giving us guidance on how to do that, right? That we can shift, we can change, we can grow, we can adapt. And thank you for having me. You know, every time you call me, I'm 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 there. So I love you. I love I love Simlink. I love everything that you're you're doing. And um to those of you that are watching, especially the teens, uh, you know, just keep on Keeping on, I believe in you and your and your dreams. You you can achieve it and you will achieve it. Well, thank you so much and good night, everyone. And see you Saturday for our National Chemistry Week celebration. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>